Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is, as I'm sure you know, one of a series of online conversations and that we are hosting with leading local and national figures to discuss some of the issues that we face as a city, um, both during and after the coronavirus lockdown. After our recent events with architects, politicians and journalists, I'm delighted to welcome tonight a group of experts, campaigners and community representatives to discuss Edinburgh's and Scotland's black history in the light of the Black Lives Matter movement. But we're going to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you won't be able to unmute yourselves, I'm afraid, during the evening or turn on your cameras. This is to allow us um, to ensure that the cameras and audio are focused on the hosts and the guests. And given the extraordinary number of people who are attending tonight, we're asking you to submit your questions and your comments via email or via Twitter. Please send these to info at ewht.org.uk. That's info at ewht.org.uk. Or tweet using the hashtag Black History Matters. We have disabled the chat and the QA functions on Zoom um, due to the large numbers of people, so please just use email or Twitter. My colleague Becky will be keeping an eye on what's coming in, and I will bring some of your questions and comments to the panel. By the way, tonight we're using an upgraded version of Zoom, um, generously donated to us by Jerry Ozaniak. <clears throat> so over to Becky. Thank you, Nick. It's amazing to see everyone here. Thank you for joining us. Um, just so you're aware, the event is also being recorded. So if you do want to catch this discussion at a later time, um, you will be able to do so. Um, please keep an eye on our social media channels for the links to this. We are on Twitter at Edinburgh WH, Facebook forward slash Edinburgh World Heritage and Instagram at Edinburgh World Heritage. So, as you'll know, the coronavirus outbreak is having a major impact on many charities in the UK and around the world. Quite apart from the human cost of the disease, the pandemic is also causing a significant financial impact, which threatens the crucial work of many charities. Um, at Edinburgh World Heritage, fundraising events have had to be cancelled. Our World Heritage exhibition and retail operation at the Tron has been closed and important conservation work has had to be paused. As a result, we expect to lose an important part of our income this year. And while we will make every effort to cut our cloth, the reality is that we, like many others, face a significant financial shortfall. So we are therefore asking our friends and supporters this evening to help us get through this period of uncertainty. If you support our conservation and community work in Edinburgh, please consider becoming one of our supporters this evening. We've made this very easy. You can text the word Edinburgh WH with the amount you want to donate to 70450. If you'd like to donate £10, for example, then text Edinburgh WH10 to 70450. That's Edinburgh WH10 to 70450. And if you'd like to become a member and support our conservation work in the city, please go to the member section of our website. And now back to you, Nick. Thank you. So time to introduce our guests. And first up is Olivia Kanyiki, who is a lead ambassador for Intercultural Youth Scotland, a youth-led grassroots charity that supports young Black, Indigenous and people of colour Scots to deliver meaningful and genuine engagement and impact for intercultural young people in Scotland. As well as her role at IWS, Olivia was a participant in the Young Women Lead Programme in 2018-19 which produced a report exploring the barriers that young women and girls face in participating in sports and physical exercise. She also served on the Young Women Lead Committee at the Scottish Parliament in 2019. Olivia lives in Glasgow and enjoys playing netball, reading novels, and listening to podcasts about intersectional feminism. Dr. Melanie Newton is Associate Professor of History and served as Director of the Caribbean Studies Programme at the University of Toronto from 2012 to 2019. She is the author of The Children of Africa in the Colonies, Free People of Colour in Barbados in the Age of Emancipation, and other scholarly articles and book chapters on gender, indigeneity, slavery and abolition. 
Recent publications include Returns to a Native Land, Indigeneity and Decolonization in the Anglophone Caribbean, and The Hauntings of Slavery, Colonialism and the Disabled Body in the Caribbean with Stephanie Kennedy. She received an Outstanding Teaching Award from the Faculty of Arts and Science in 2015 and is Chair of the Faculty of Arts and Science Academic Appeals Board at the University of Toronto. Her current book project is entitled This Island's Mine, Indigeneity in the Caribbean Atlantic World. Sir Jeff Palmer is Professor Emeritus in the School of Life Sciences at Harriet Watt and a human rights activist. Jeff was born in Jamaica. He came to London as an immigrant in 1955 and after overcoming various difficulties, worked and attended evening classes to improve his qualifications. He subsequently entered Leicester, Edinburgh and Harriet Watt Universities, where he gained BSc, PhD and DSc degrees, respectively. Jeff invented the barley abrasion process and has been described as a father of the Scottish craft ale revival. He is the author of many scientific papers and has published books on green science, as well as the history of slavery in the West Indies. He serves on the boards of various charitable organisations and was awarded the OBE in 2003 and a knighthood in 2014 for his contributions to science, charity and human rights. Lisa Williams grew up in Dorset in a British Grenadian family and after a childhood travelling around the world moved to the Caribbean to run wellness programmes and cultural and educational exchanges for 20 years. After relocating to Edinburgh in 2011, she founded the Edinburgh Caribbean Association and now curates a range of arts events across Scotland to promote Caribbean culture spanning film, literature and live music. Lisa runs educational and anti-racist programmes in schools and universities and leads walking tours focusing on Edinburgh's black history. She is an author and poet, chairs and performs at literary festivals and loves to teach creative writing to all ages. She has an Emmy in Arts, Festival and Cultural Management and is an Honorary Fellow in the School of History, Classics and Archaeology at the University of Edinburgh. So welcome and thanks to our panellists. So we'll start. Jackie Kay, our Macca in Scotland, said that Scotland is a canny nation when it comes to remembering and forgetting. The plantation owner is never wearing a kilt. So while Scotland's and Edinburgh's black history is undoubtedly rich and complex, there's no avoiding the topic of slavery and following abolition, the degree to which Scotland has come to terms with its past. So let's, let's start with a broad question for the panel um, about the telling of black history in Scotland, which many people have described as poor, both in terms of the experience of black people in Scotland and the impact overseas of the actions of Scots on black people. So what's the panel's perspective on this? And then we'll, we'll start this with Lisa. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you very much for introducing me and thanks very much everyone for tuning in too. Um, it's not for a lack of work on this. So for, um, for the last 20 years, there's been so much work by Scottish historians, there's been so much work by activists. We've had Black History Month here for about 20 years. Um, I think it hasn't filtered through to the rest of the population the way that it should have done, especially in the education system and especially in our heritage institutions. I think there's an issue with Scottish history itself not being taught in school adequately enough over a period of time. I think it's partly the, the scholarship of history itself is not trans, transnational enough or hasn't been. Um, and I think that a lot of people are very astonished that black people have been present in Scotland since Roman times. And I'm not exactly sure why, what the barriers are that, that means that this hasn't happened. Um, I think there's a lack of conversation, perhaps of black scholars abroad as well, in Africa and the Caribbean. We could be doing a lot more of that quite easily. Um, and there's definitely a lack of understanding of the legacies from this period in terms of racism here and also colorism and, and poverty um, in places like the Caribbean. So we'll come on to some of those themes and explore them during the evening, but let's stay at this high level for the moment. Jeff, what's your perspective on that, on the telling of black history in Scotland? Well, I think the, the emphasis on it started in about 2007 at mm. the commemoration of the abolition of the slave trade. And I think that um, Scottish people, 
have suffered from the fact that I've given many lectures around Scotland and the, the consistent response has been, why hasn't anybody told us this before? And therefore the Scottish people, in many ways I sympathize because they were taught about Livingston and Africa. And therefore they felt that Scotland had a great role in terms of um, you know, going to Africa and converting and, and managing the, say, religion there. Right. But the point is that they knew nothing about the Caribbean. And therefore, uh, how could they understand slavery, chattel slavery, my history, my ancestors' history? How could they understand the great um, buildings around them and where the money came from and, and, and very um, a significant families in Scotland? You know, the Weatherburns, the Grants, the Sterlings of Kerr, they not, knew nothing about them. So and therefore, happened? that's so the fault of historians. Right, so why hasn't anyone told us this before? That's a question for the professional historians. Melanie. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so I should say I'm, I'm in Canada, I'm from the Caribbean, but you know, I live and work in Canada. And I do find it interesting, I think there is, thinking about this from the perspective of Canada, um, a way in which conversations about race between um, countries in the West, where you have white majority populations and societies like those of North America, where the majority of the population um, is, are the descendants of, they're basically the beneficiaries of white supremacy and the legacies of colonialism. Um, and then many societies in Western Europe, which were the imperial metropoles of these, of these right. empires. And there is a bit, I think, of a, a bit of a game of white supremacy in which um, places like Canada and Scotland um, perpetuate a narrative in which um, the problem is always to the south. It's England and the United States. So these are societies that where they're sort of people are encouraged to be given a pass on the history of white supremacy and slavery. Um, but then there's also a narrative of a certain kind of victimization. Um, so the idea that somehow um, the expansion of the British Empire was also done to say Scots and Irish. Um, the myth that things like um, indentureship, um, so indentured servitude of um, Europeans was somehow akin to slavery. There is a maintenance of these kinds of actually completely erroneous narratives um, in um, various societies around the West. So that the sort of the, the home of these legacies of white supremacy mm -hmm. is always located in say Paris, London, um, Washington, or New York. It's, and places like Canada, like Scotland, um, a, a narrative is perpetuated by institutions in those countries in which they um, sort of ex exonerate themselves of any kind of responsibility. So I, I think, think this is not just right. an, an issue in Scotland. And I will say I was sort of stunned, I'm learning some of the narratives about Scottish history in these conversations. And the idea that the legacy of David Livingstone is one to be proud of, that is completely, as someone who is not in Scotland, that was stunning to me. <laughs> um, that's the first time I've ever, ever heard that because well, it is a, part yeah, of we the- We have a very impressive monument to him um, in Princess yeah. Street Garden. So that's a topic I think for another evening. For another day, yes. <laughs> uh, interesting parallels between Canada and Scotland there and their, their southerly neighbors. But Olivia, let's turn to you now in terms of um, the, the, the history that you learned and what you experienced growing up as a black woman in Scotland. What's your perspective on this and the telling of Scottish history? And, and how that has um, in, in been inclusive or not for black people? I felt like with the way I learned about black Scottish history, like I had to learn it in my own personal time. Like it wasn't introduced at schools, at secondary school. I left secondary school 10 years, nine, 11 year, 10 years ago. So I just felt it was never part of the curriculum at all. I felt the curriculum was very like looking through the lens for Europe only. And I only knew about it like from a glance of studying Morning Studies, which looked at the American side of things, but it wasn't much about the hidden history of Scotland, history of its transatlantic slave trade. So knowing about it more and having a talk conversation during this time has kind of made me like wanting to know like why as a nation we tried to hide it so badly because it must have been that bad. So I feel like as a black woman in Scotland, we should be know, known about this and address those issues. Excellent. Okay. The, so we're going to going one step further now. Um, many of these topics are sensitive and the, the precise nature of Scotland's involvement in the slave trade, of course, um, is, is controversial to some extent. 
Um, but some historians have argued that Scots participated in and profited from slavery more than other nations relative to the size of its population. So you could characterize Scots and, and, and Scotland as a leading nation in terms of how it benefited and exploited slavery. Um, so to, really to, to, to Jeff and to Melanie, let's start with Jeff. Do you agree with that characterization? Well, yes, in a way, but I, I would like to qualify that. You see, I can't, you know, one historian regards it as amnesia. And I feel that you can't have an amnesia of something you didn't know in the first place. And, and, and therefore, a lot of Scots, as I said, were told giving the, the African narrative. But when they, we started to tell them about the Caribbean, a, a lot of uh, Scottish people were extremely disturbed by what they were hearing. And, and they could, when we pointed out the, the historical monuments, the street names, um, you know, the Gallery of Modern Art, you know, which is an iconic building in the middle of Glasgow, was a slave master's house. They found that absolutely abhorrent. You know, Buchanan Street, Oswald Street, um, you know, the necropolis where people are buried, you know, the merchant's house. The fact is, once we start putting Edinburgh, you know, when we talked about the Weatherburns, which are not far away in, 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 in Inver Inveresk, in Musselburgh, and then we talked about the Joseph Knight case in Edinburgh, where the, the myth, as my colleague said earlier, that, you know, servitude was slavery, so we abolished slavery with, with the Joseph Knight case, and that's in law books. Yeah. The point is that we need a revision, and we need the curriculum to now include this history or the next generation we're going to pass on this racism and this neglect of Scottish stroke black history. Do you agree, Melanie, that you can characterise Scotland as being disproportionately, a country that disproportionately benefited and, and took part in the, in the transatlantic slave trade and the benefits from that? You're on mute, Melanie, I think. Sorry, can you hear me now? Um, so certainly, so I do not personally research Scottish slave owners. But there is no doubt that the names of colonial governors, um, ministers for war and colonies, the names of Scottish figures are everywhere. Um, so there are scholars who have said and who have documented that disproportionately the names of Scots appear in, for example, the um, records from the 1830s when slave owners were compensated at emancipation by the British government for abolish, the abolition of slavery, that the names of Scottish slave owners appear in that record in disproportionate numbers in terms of the number of Scots in the British population. So they seem to have represented a significant part of the slave owning population. Right. But certainly in my own personal research, which at the moment is on 18th and early 19th century um, um, diplomacy of empire, Scottish um, figures are extremely powerful in colonial policy, extremely powerful in trade policy, and of course, central to both of those are slavery and the slave trade. So it's not, this is not a marginal um, relationship. And in my previous research on the history of slavery and emancipation in Barbados, a number of the colonial governors who I studied were Scottish. So if that's the case for Barbados, I think you will find it at every level of the colonial administration um, in many different parts of- And Tom yeah. Devine has, Tom Devine has uh, proposed lots of reasons that um, uh, from the number of young of male, um, the sons of Scottish noble families that needed to go abroad and, and, and make their name and so on, and lots of reasons for that. But turning to Lisa for a moment, um, how, how do you tell that story, Lisa, in terms of Scotland's overall benefit from slavery? And what, what reaction do you have from the people that you, that you guide around the city? Um, I would definitely agree with what Melanie's saying about the colonial governors. I think people are quite shocked when it's Edinburgh men who are involved in putting down slave rebellions in quite a violent way. And I think people that come on the tour are very shocked by that because they have no idea about that history. Um, I suppose in terms of things like land ownership in certain islands, Scots of, you know, let's say Antigua, for example, it's 72% of the um, land is owned by Scots at a certain period. You have Scots overrepresented in ships captains, um, doctors coming out of Glasgow and Edinburgh universities, um, and also having an effect on the economy 
in a disproportionate way, partly because it's smaller and partly because it was in a worse state than England at that particular time before the, the slave trade system really starts to, to kick off. Now, when I'm taking people on tours, um, one of the things that's important to mention is that Scots were involved before 1707. So before the Act of Union, they're involved in places like Suriname. They're also involved in the slave trade system in the Dutch Caribbean until the 1860s. They're involved in places like Brazil until 1888. So we're talking about a much longer period of time than just being involved in the British colonies um, themselves as well. I also make sure that we talk about the resistance leaders and the people that were involved in the rebellions. I talk about the Haitian Revolution, I talk about other revolutions that were happening in, in British colonies like um, Grenada, for example. Um, and what I do is try to encourage empathy for people who are going through that experience. So I don't speak about it in a dry way. It's a very emotional journey. And I warn people before we go on the tours that it will be an emotional journey and you will get certain feelings come, coming up. But I do say that we, it's important that we move away from this idea of guilt, because I think that gets in the way of having constructive conversations and actually be able to um, focus on people that were fighting for freedom, fighting for liberation, whether that's here in Scotland or whether that's abroad. And, 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 Olivia, yeah. and Nick, like, could I just say one thing? Yes. The, the, the figures are that Scots owned about 30% of the slave plantations say in 1800 and about 32% of the slaves with a population of 1.5 million compared to the whole of the UK. So, you know, the, the Scots had a significant role, but I think what we've got to try and, and clarify is that role was run by politicians like Henry Dundas. He selected the governors, say Balcaras for Jamaica, Ninian home for, you know, um, the, the, the Grenada. So the point is that we have therefore got to look at the political system at that time. Yeah. And for example, you know, Dundas is regarded as, you know, the uncrowned king of Scotland. We'll and therefore to, we uh, must look we'll at the history the... in that way rather than talk about the people. Yeah, we'll come on to Henry Dundas in a moment. We are going to keep going at a clip with a lot to cover. Yeah. Olivia, I just want okay, to get your no perspective, uh, your perspective uh, growing up in Glasgow and being living and being a Glaswegian. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do you have a sense that um, Glasgow is coming to terms with these issues more than the rest of Scotland? Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely. I feel like there's been things about, as um, we talked about, but the different street names of Glasgow, like Glasford Street, Ingram Street, saying that they were the plantation owners that um, made uh, the trading from different countries like Maryland and Virginia and Jamaica as well. And I feel like without that education, if, if it doesn't get decolonized the curriculum, we're going to pass on, wipe out these erase information from the history of our ancestors about um, just how we've contributed to humanity, but that's not getting taught in the school curriculum. And how else will we get educated about this? I was never educated about the Black, Black Scripts history in the curriculum at all until maybe get in touch with social media or reading books about it. And I just feel like more needs to be with the community of young people of colour who are students. They need to feel empowered and involved into the curriculum so we actually know what's going on with our world, what happened in the past. And yeah, I know it's not the, it's a kind of a shameful history we have been going through, but it needs to be taught so that it doesn't happen again or white supremacy and racism doesn't keep going down through the generation after generation. It's time to address it now. Very good. Okay, we're going to have a quick two minute um, shoot over to, to Becky and um, see what's coming in via social media and via email. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, everyone's been sending in some brilliant questions. So thank you for that. Remember that you can send them to us via Twitter using the hashtag Black History Matters, and um, thank you to those of you who have been following along, and obviously also via email info at ewht.org.uk. Um, Maggie on Twitter asks, um, does the panel think that white fragility in the face of studying black history is a factor in maintaining silence? Uh, that's on Twitter. We've also had um, sort of similar questions from Catherine and Anna via email, asking about how museums and galleries might um, care for objects that are result, the result of the profits of slavery and also how museums might best tell the story, how they can contribute to the telling of black history. And uh, possibly one for Lisa, we have um, an STGA Blue Badge tourist guide um, writing in Katrina, um, asking how we can encourage tour guides 
to decolonize what they tell of Edinburgh Scottish history. Lisa, can you give us a very quick answer on that? <laughs> which, which question do you want me to answer? Well, so the question of how can we decolonize our, in terms of the, the material and the communication that the, the uh -huh. tourists receive on the city, is there a way of decolonizing the information? Yeah, sure. But I mean, decolonizing, even if you're talking about just decolonizing knowledge, is it's quite a long process and quite a difficult process. So I don't think it's something that can be done just by bringing in a few facts from, from, from um, Long -term let's say, process. colonial history that you're not necessarily seeing here. So it's, it, it's quite a long and complicated process. But I think to try to bring in as many different perspectives as you can within your tour, so bringing in perspectives from historians who are looking at it from a completely different lens or maybe looking at Scotland from outside, for example. So there's lots of different ways that you could go about doing that. Um, so. Okay, yeah. Excellent. We're gonna let's move on to the case of Knight versus Wedderburn. I did want to cover this um, because it's an, imp an important part of the jigsaw. I'm going to ask Melanie to um, to just briefly touch on that seminal legal case and the relevance um, to Scotland's wider involvement in the slave trade. You're on mute, Melanie. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to be polite and I end up being inefficient. Um, so the Knight versus Wedderburn case um, is one of a whole series of legal cases. And it's important to understand that in a number of countries in Europe, um, particularly in Britain and France, um, enslaved people, um, free black people and abolitionists um, have been trying to bring cases to court for a couple of decades to try and challenge um, the holding of people in slavery in these metropolitan um, environments. So the Knight versus Wedderburn case um, was the case of a young man, uh, Joseph Knight, whose um, owner, I forget if his name was James or John Wedderburn, I always for, um, forget which one it is, but his owner Wedderburn had brought him from Jamaica to, um, to Scotland in the 1770s. And he challenged, um, Joseph Knight challenged his, um, his enslavement and in the end, through a series of different um, levels of the legal system, um, the courts found that the onus was on Wedderburn to prove that he owned um, Joseph Knight and that um, there was no positive law in Scotland to enable any slave owner to continue to hold someone in slavery against their, their consent or to force them to return to a slave owning jurisdiction. They went a little bit further than a previous case in England in 1772, which was the famous case of the, the man James Somerset, who also challenged his enslavement. So it's a very important case. It is an important victory in terms of thinking about um, um, the history of enslavement in the Atlantic world, but it had no implications for slavery in Jamaica, which is where um, Joseph Knight had been brought from by Wedderburn. And it had no um, implications for the wider legality of the slave trade. And just very briefly, because I know we're coming to this, Henry Dundas was Lord Advocate at the time. He argued um, against uh, Wedderburn's appeal, I believe. No, it may have been early. I forget the different levels of the case. But he was involved in the case arguing um, in favor of Joseph Knight's position. But I think it's really important to remember, just as if you're a lawyer and you represent a murderer, it doesn't make you a supporter of murder. If you're a lawyer and you represent an enslaved person against a slave owner, that does not automatically make you an abolitionist. It may make you a good lawyer. And there's a lot of evidence that his arguments were quite compelling. Um, Dundas's arguments are quite compelling, but that does not automatically make him an abolitionist. And Jeff, did you have any perspective on this case? Well, I have because I've been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> the, the, the point oh, yeah. is that the name was John Weatherman, Sir John Weatherman. And the fact is that Henry Dundas pleaded. He wasn't a lawyer for him. He was a Lord Advocate. And I've just put on Twitter today, the fact is that Henry Dundas, you know, the historians have said he, um, um, he, he, he put up a brilliant argument or an eloquent argument. This is what was said. It wasn't eloquent because they only reported a part of it. And all that information comes from the, the Caledonian Mercury newspaper. But that's where that comes from in 1776. And what Dundas was saying, and what the judges were saying at the end of that case, if Joseph Knight was in Jamaica, he'd be a slave. The point is that case was a showcase. It was a showcase to balance the English case about Somerset. 
The point is Scotland had to do a bit better. The point is that Joseph Knight was never a slave. Nowhere in any of the documents they said he was a slave. He was in servitude. So how can you abolish slavery with servitude? Um, the professor in Edinburgh, Karen, the closest he's come to describe it in a three hour lecture, three hours of lectures. Um, in other words, Joseph Knight was a slave. In other words, that's the closest. And therefore, in fact, the case was staged in order to try and arrive at a conclusion that Scotland abolished slavery. And that is very dangerous because a lot of Scottish people and even our previous speaker have some of that in mind because that's what was taught. Joseph Knight was not a slave, he was a servant. And the point is though historians and other people have called him a slave in order for that abolition. Now, a lot of Scottish people will not listen to you talking about Scotland and slavery because they say, we abolished it, yes. which is completely untrue. And that's the critical Thank point of, 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 of talking about history in its proper sense in terms of research and use that information to come to uh, a, 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 an honest conclusion. Exactly. So I, I wanted, that's why I wanted to, to make that clear about that particular case, given its importance and, and the way it's cited often um, in the history of slavery in Scotland. So let's turn now to, the, to Henry Dundas himself um, and, and his role um, in the history of slavery. And there are clearly two schools of thought, those that see him very much as an, as an anti-abolitionist and those that have more, a more favourable view of him. Um, so let's start with um, the events of 1792 and the infamous gradual amendments. And Lisa, could you briefly describe for everyone um, what, what occurred in that time? <laughs> Sure, I mean, it's complicated, but as we haven't got much time, we'll make it simple. Um, so 2nd of April, 1792, Wilberforce is putting forth his motion for immediate abolition. Um, Dundas is highly influential at that point, um, introduces the idea of gradual. The motion goes through for gradual abolition, votes 193 to 125. Um, what's important is a few days later, um, he's praised by the pro-slavery lobby and also we need to put it in context of 1796 where although there's no actual evidence that he voted in 1796 he's still highly influential um, with at least 10 MPs to encourage another vote from 74 to 70 at that point so we need to look at those two things together and not just 1792 on its own we need to think about the period of what's happening in the world with the the wars with the french and how that's playing out in the caribbean between those two votes as well so of course we've got the the invasion of santa man which is haiti um pitt and dundas are involved in that together um and also putting down other revolts and rebellions against slavery at that particular point so we need to look at it all as uh, as a whole so jeff um how do you see dundas uh, during this period in the 1790s as a abolitionist or as an anti-abolitionist? Well, he was a politician um, trying to prolong the slave trade, and it's that simple. And the, the fact is in 1792, as Lisa said, there was the amendment. But if you read Clarkson, and Clarkson was an abolitionist, and Clarkson was there with Wilberforce, and Clarkson has written a book, and Clarkson has said in that book that, in fact, Henry Dundas not only uh, put forward the amendment, he actually opposed it in 1796, opposed it, a any sort of um, abolition of the trade. And he opposed it again in 1800. And Clarkson says those two dates, he proposed those himself. And therefore, historians have muddled it by saying the House of Lords didn't do this and the House of Lords didn't do that. William Hague in his book, and he should know something about the House of Lords, you know, the Prime Minister. And he said the tactic was, if you didn't get a clear vote in the Commons, and if, if, and if Dundas can frustrate that, then the House of Lords was not going to act. And therefore it was, um, as, as Thomas the historian said, it was a ruse. Right. And if you look at Fry's book, and what I put up on Twitter recently, that in Fry's book, Fry says Dundas, during for gradual, he was going to breed, uh, proposed to breed the slaves, girls on the uh, 16 and men on the 20 in yeah. order to keep the population going when the slave trade was eventually abolished. 
This Mel is not an abolitionist. Right, Melanie, what do, you, I mean, the, what do you think the consensus among professional historians is on this question of, of Dutton Das's actions during the 1790s? Um, so I think it's important to understand that in recent months, um, through the actions of a couple of people who don't actually study uh, the subject, the idea that somehow there's a debate among historians about whether or not Dundas was an abolitionist, there is no debate among people who actually do this research. Um, no one sees him as an abolitionist. Um, gradual abolitionism was not understood either at the time or by scholars to be an abolitionist position. Henry Dundas's speech in 1792 was more or less echoing um, a law from 1788 by the Jamaican House of Assembly, and he was quite close to, I think, um, so the representative in London of the, um, of the uh, Jamaican planters as Stephen Fuller. Um, so he was very close to, to pro-slavery lobbyists and to planters. He basically echoed their own plans for preparing for the eventual abolition of slavery. Um, sorry, the eventual abolition of the slave trade. So they knew that this was likely coming, but they sought to delay it as long as possible. And in that time, the consequence of Dundas's intervention in 1792 was in fact to escalate the slave trade. So that the years from 1793 to 1807, for many of which Dundas was actually the Minister for War and Colonies, actually would see some of the highest averages per year in terms of slave trading. So he was not, this is, there's no basis and there's no historical, meaningful, this historical debate about this. It's, in addition to um, what Professor Palmer has said about um, Thomas Clarkson's evaluation of Henry Dundas, um, during the debate on the abolition of the slave trade in 1806, which was the same year that Dundas was impeached, incidentally, um, Ch um, Charles James Fox, who was one of the leading abolitionists, Whig abolitionists in Parliament, said in that debate that Dundas was the major impediment to um, abolition in, um, in Parliament. So it's, it's a false debate. Thank you. Very clear. And Olivia, what, do you, what should we do with the statue? Um, hearing about Henry Dundas and like what he's been doing and the fact that he delayed abolition um, for, uh, which, which caused a lot of deaths and suffering for black men and black women, and the fact that he's still in St Andrew's Square like, representing whatever he does, I just feel like it should be discussed about maybe taking it down and in the future we should have more notable role models and public figures you know standing up for oppression and um, racism and signifying actually real positive change within our society I don't think these statues should be up that's my personal intake on that and putting that but I just feel like all these statues are all over the UK cities representing the oppression of black people it's just not okay like I don't think we should be having them up there personally I think that and Lisa, Lisa um, Melanie talked briefly about oh. some of the um results of um, the gra of gradualism. You, could you tell us a little bit about the impact on, on women, especially young women and young girls um, in the slave trade? Um, yeah, I think one of the really difficult aspects of this, and um, especially when I'm on the tours, it's a really difficult area to talk about. Maybe that's why people shy away from it. It's a specific effect on, on young girls and women, because for example, we have evidence of Scottish slave plantation owners who were having, you know, their impregnating girls as young as 12, having their the first child for them. Um, and we, we forget sometimes that it was a, an entire system of sexual exploitation. So it's reproductive, it's a reproductive, um, forced reproductive system that women are and girls are being part of and being forced into. Um, and also the, the between 1807 and let's say 1838 when the apprenticeship period ends that's a very difficult time for women because of course they're not new workers coming in so there's this emphasis on reproduction and um, women having to have as many children as possible and the the, the effects at that at that period of the horrors that are unleashed on girls and women at that particular point are perhaps definitely not talked about enough in, in, in Scotland and, you know, in general conversation about this period. Can I just say one quick thing there? Um, I just want to say, you know, that there is a whole field of scholarship 
that does look at, so this, this period is called the amelioration period, which is about improvement of slavery as slave owners saw it. And it did rest absolutely on getting um, women to have, to have more unnatural increase, more live births. Because the, the thing about the slave trade was that planters re relied on it in order to keep their populations up, right? So there is actually a lot of scholarship that looks at um, this period and at the gender implications. Um, there's scholarship on histories of infertility among enslaved women because that was a, a huge reality of life that the conditions of labor for and um, of nutrition and labor and so on, living conditions were so appalling that there were high rates of infertility, low rates of um, actual births being, children being carried to term, high rates of infant mortality, people died very young. Um, so there is a field of scholarship. So I think the question, the issue is, I just want to make it clear, it's not that there aren't scholars who do this work. Mm -hmm. The question is, why does it not? Um, what kinds of gatekeeping structures are in place to ensure that it doesn't change the wider conversation? The scholarship mm -hmm. is there. Exactly. So I think that looks, we have to look at the collusion between a range of different kinds of social institutions that ensure that certain kinds of narratives get perpetuated mm -hmm. um, outside of this field, mm -hmm. um, because that is well understood by scholars who do the work that, you know, that I do. Thank you. I just want to say at this point that um, there is a new plaque, um, a temporary plaque on St. Andrew's Square concerning Henry Dundas. Um, Edinburgh World Heritage was part of the group looking at that wording. Um, the wording states um, that Henry Dundas was instrumental in deferring the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade. And having examined the scholarship and the um, historiography on this topic, we have concluded that that is absolutely correct and we support this plaque um, and there, there really should be no debate about that. So let's uh, move on at that point and here, go back to Becky and hear what's coming in via social media and any other questions. Yeah, we've had a, a, a flood of comments and questions, lots of people really, really enjoying the event. So thank you to our panellists. Um, we've had a question um, about the uh, James Gillespie School. How could a state school in Edinburgh um, deal with its history fully, including the whitewashing of Gillespie's story? Um, we've had people asking about how we can celebrate um, black history in Edinburgh. That was from Paul and also an assistant professor from um, Iowa asking a great question on engagement. How can folks who have traditionally been left out of the practice of heritage or been negatively impacted by it um, through processes like gentrification become better engaged and empowered? Um, and we've also had lots of people, of course, commenting on the removal of the Black Lives Matter protester um, sculpture from the formerly <laughs> Edward Wilson uh, plinth, um, asking, should, should it have remained up? Should, should that have been taken down? And um, comments and things on the... Uh, what, what the impact of that might be for statues in Edinburgh as well. Anyone want to take any of those? Just uh, quickly, quick fire. Anyone want to answer any of those points? Well, uh, my view is quite clear. You shouldn't take statues down um, because um, with the Edinburgh statue with Dundas, people can uh, walk by it and get their own idea. And this nonsense about professional historians. The professional historians have been hiding this history from the general public for self-serving reasons. And the point is the general public has taken an interest in this history through the media and have learned a hell of a lot more than they learned in school or from universities. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea that somebody can't come along and say something about history without a professional historian sanctioning it is nonsense. And therefore, as far as the statues are concerned, I think they should have a narrative on them, like the Dundas' statue, telling the truth as much as you can on a plaque, and therefore, we are educating the public, waiting for the schools to put it in the curriculum. The point is that you take down statues, you have to start taking down the Gallery of Modern Art, the Necropolis, all the streets down in Edinburgh, all the banks that benefited. And therefore, it's a ridiculous notion. The point is that we must put plaques on these um, uh, objects which are related to slavery so the public can almost educate themselves. Any, any other thought, how to celebrate black history? Any thought, Olivia, any, any other thoughts on, on what, what, what should the Scottish government think about in terms of celebrating black history or, or other institutions? I think with, with my experiences, because it wasn't it was omitted from my curriculum, but then it was talked about in my English past paper, like about 
the to Kill a Mockingbird novel that talked about the racial injustice in America, but to make it more UK centric, Scottish centred, I think, and celebrating what we actually contributed to society instead of mm -hmm. the trauma and the, the sad stories that we've gone through. I think more celebration and as well as that Black History Month, the British Black History Month, um, I know that started in the 1980s, but that needs to be more recognised like as a nation to talk about that more, about the celebration and achievement that we have achieved over those years. Okay. And that's left out. I'm going to move on now. Um, one, one point that comes up quite a lot, and I wanted to get clear from, from our experts, is that many people make a comparison between Scots who are, um, they would say, enslaved as indentured servants, serving in the West Indies during the 18th century, especially after the various Jacobite risings how we should think of that status versus the status of being a chattel slave. Um, so I'm going to ask Melanie really to, to, to address that point. Okay, so um, legally there are two completely different things. Um, so indentureship, um, depending on the time period, and so the 17th and 18th centuries, these are people who have contracted, made contracts for their labor and for passage to work for a particular um, planter, and it's an exchange for promises of uh, land, what's called freedom due, after their contracts were over. Um, and so it's not legally at all the same as slavery, right? That's very clear. Um, now, we can argue that certainly in the 17th century, the conditions of life for indentured laborers could be terrible. Um, however, over time, what you do see, particularly as the system of enslavement in um, the colonies comes to be so closely associated with black and indigenous and eventually with, um, with, with blackness. It comes to be this really clearly racialized system that the trajectories of life for indentured servants are completely different from um, even free people of color, right? So you have indentured servants who, people who grow out as indentured servants who eventually come to be landowners themselves, slave owners themselves. And they always, there's, there's this basic privilege of whiteness that comes to be associated with um, even with being the poorest of white people. So it's a longer conversation, but there, it's a myth. The idea that these two forms of experience and status are really equivalent, this is, this is not true. But it is also important to recognize that um, planters recognized very early on in the sort of colonial project, the potential for people to organize together. So they, so particularly in the early years of establishing these plantation colonies, when you have um, white indentured servants and enslaved um, people, black and indigenous enslaved people working together doing the same labor, um, this struck, these structures of white supremacy that sought to clearly distinguish um, the experience um, and future trajectories of white indentured servants from those of enslaved black people um, and enslaved indigenous people, these are put in place very early. So law um, is really used to create the structures of white supremacy in which indentured servants and past indentured servants, they are encouraged right. to identify their own aspirations right. um, with that legal structure. Okay, I'm gonna, I, that's a very clear answer. I'm gonna, I know everyone would like to comment on that point as well, but I'm just gonna move on just in the interest of time because we want to cover some other topics. So I'd like to turn to the question of Scotland's amnesia concerning its role in the slave trade. And Tom Devine has commented that Scottish engagement in slave system <coughs> itself was either ignored or lost both from academic history and popular memory for generations until the early years of the present century. So I'd like each of the panelists to really reflect on the nature of that amnesia and what we can learn from it. Lisa, let's start with you. Okay, sure. Um, this is it's a controversial word for a lot of reasons. Um, I think quite often it's deliberately done, actually. Um, there was an exhibition done recently where I talked with several of the curators about uh, a very important aspect, which was to do with slavery. And it could have been put into the exhibition, but wasn't. I was very, very disappointed that at this point that we're, we're still dealing with that kind of thing. Um, I think sometimes there is a, there's an awkwardness around it. I speak to a lot of museum curators. Sometimes they don't have, they, they say they don't have the language or they, they worry about offending people. I think there's an issue of, um, of, of co-curation that we're really missing at this particular point where people could very easily fill in um, information, have different perspectives on it. 
Um, I think there's no, ex there should be absolutely no excuse for it at, at this particular point, but I do wonder what decisions are made, like who makes the decisions when you are uh, curating a particular exhibition, when you, you have the information, what kind of thought process are you having to deliberately take that out of your exhibition? Um, so, so, so I'm going to ask the panel, I mean, the, the, the representation of this topic in our institutions in Glasgow and in Edinburgh is relatively small. Are we, are we asking for a far greater representation um, in the National Museum of Scotland and other institutions of this chapter in Scotland's history? Is, is that a unanimous call from this group? Well, we need greater diversity. And if you look at those organisations, what I say to people when they talk to me, I say, look around your office and see how diverse you are. And therefore, to me, that reflects the problem. Mm -hmm. And as far as I'm concerned, the, 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 the Scottish people have responded. And it's insulting to say that the Scottish people don't want to hear their history. It's not true. The point is that what is true is you have people with false national pride, false national pride, who think they're defending the Scottish people, um, it, the sensitivities. And, and that is completely wrong. And there are museums of slavery in Bristol and in Liverpool. Is that something that we should be seeing in Glasgow? Uh, not necessarily only in Glasgow. I don't want to be controversial here. I think it should be discussed and decided where those mu the, the museum or museums should be. Olivia, what do you think? Um, I actually went to one in Liverpool and it was really interesting to hear more of the the stories and what's been happening in the, the past of it, our past history. And I think I have to travel all the way to England to do that. Like, I think it should be something in Scotland as well and be more informative and raise awareness about our history. And I think as well with the amnesia, about Scotland's amnesia case about people wanting to forget and cover up the history. I think reading the book, The White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo talked about how this, like, this conversation about race, racism, everyone just gets really discomfort, like uncomfortable, and they don't like talking about it or they check out or they just get defensive. And I think the lack of understanding of white supremacy, which is a system which affected the black people for centuries and even apart like today, I think has made it evident that we as a nation need to like start talking about it and start implementing it into the curriculum and to other teaching facilities to understand that the oppression and the colonialism and today's um how it's affecting us day to day in systemic and individual level because it happens in all levels of the society and it needs to be stopped Thank you. Let's turn, let's turn to, let's, we're going to move on because we've got, still got some, a few things to cover um, and we want some more questions from the, from the audience. So let's, let's briefly turn to the question of Scotland's role in the abolitionist movement. Um, Frederick, Dund Frederick Douglass famously visited um, Edinburgh and lived, lived in the city for a number of years. Lisa, I'm um, sorry, Melanie, I think I'm going to ask to ask, ask, answer this first. Could you comment on Scotland's role and Edinburgh's role in the abolition movement? Um, I would say that on that point, I think, so to come back to this narrative about David Livingston, um, just because I think it's actually a little bit more important to talk about that than the Frederick Douglass visit just for a moment. I think actually this shows why, so the, the term amnesia um, is not the right word for this. There, if there was a deliberate process after the abolition of slavery in the British Empire to sort of disown slavery and to take no account for it and to sort of construct a new narrative in which um, Britain becomes the, the home of abolitionism. And I think Scotland is very much part of that. So I think there is a long legacy of gatekeeping to ensure that such narratives remain in place. So I think the whole, like the emphasis on, you know, David Livingston and somehow, you know, converting people who didn't ask to be converted being a good thing. Um, the sort of emphasis on Frederick Douglass's tour, the fact, you know, abolitionists did a lot of tours, um, African-American abolitionists, and those tours are actually incredibly important to the history of, um, of um, abolition in the United States. Um, but that is not something particular to Scotland, per se. So I think it really does go back to this question that, you know, amnesia is not the right word for this. This is part of the, 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 the preference, the cherry picking of one set of narratives over another is part of the long history of violence that slavery and white supremacy um, represent. 
Any other comments on that point from the panel? Well, Sir Frederick Douglass was here in, you know, 1846. The point is that that's before the American abolished their slavery in 1865. And I think what Frederick Douglass was doing, and we have an expert, Celeste at the Edinburgh University, who's an expert on Frederick Douglass. And I've written a, an article for her quite recently on this. And the point is that Frederick Douglass was challenging, you know, institutions like the church to say you re receive money from slavery and therefore you should, in fact, help with the abolition process. Th that was his main argument. Right. And of course, his famous phrase is send back the money if, if in fact you are not going to help. And I think that's about the role of Frederick Douglass in abolition in, in Scotland, in, in that sense. Okay, back to Becky. Um, yes, we've had some really lovely questions. One for um, Olivia about um, heritage and how we make um, it a little bit more interesting, how we make it more engaging and inviting to young people from BAME backgrounds. That's from Krista on Twitter. As a career, um, yes. Yes, yes, as a career, but also just as, uh, as people living in, in Scotland and Edinburgh do, young people from BA, BAME backgrounds feel like the heritage of a place like Edinburgh belongs to them. Um, someone really wanting to hear your thoughts on that, Olivia. Um, well, for me, I just kind of got involved with like different, like it was sort of uni, like different societies, like societies like that kind of embrace what I'm from with cultural identities. And then it kind of stemmed from like joining um, for my studies. I did a postgraduate studies and then learning to do an internship. And after that, I found a like-minded community with an organization and just the connection. Like I think finding your own kind of community of people that actually supports everything that who we are and our beliefs and our values is really important. And I think that's a fundamental part of trying to uh, reach for equality. So I think just keep looking for the host connection of people that you care about and working together to achieve quality. Thanks. That's an gonna... interesting point, Olivia. Thank you. So, Black, so the last question, really, um, and um, maybe, maybe room for one or two more, but Black history seems to be largely invisible from Scotland's history beyond the realm of slavery and abolition. Are there any other stories that the panel would like to, to share about individuals or events that might help correct this? Our focus tonight has very, been very much on, on mm. slavery and abolition. But what other stories um, would you bring? Maybe we start with Lisa. Yeah, I think we had to be really careful about conflating black history with slavery, especially in schools. And when I talk to people who are history teachers or training to be, I say, let's make sure that we talk about, let's say, great African civilizations, you make sure you teach that before um, you, you talk about slavery, for example. But there are so many stories, even in Edinburgh itself, you have everything from courtiers in the early 16th century to soldiers, entertainers, intellectuals. You've got a very big pan-Africanist um, movement that starts to develop at the, the early 20th century in Edinburgh University. We've got Scotland's version of Windrush, if you like, with um, the 900 men that come from British Honduras during the, the Second World War and are stationed throughout Scotland. And their story is really interesting, really amazing. Um, and I think that's a particularly interesting story because they come in 1941, 1942. By 1943, their, their units are disbanded. And it's because of communications that are happening with the British government, even though they're very much um, welcomed and supported by local people. You see this again and again, actually, with, with black people in Scotland, local people really embracing them. But the powers that be creating issues or having an issue. And at that point, it was the issue of what they would have called race mixing. And there are various documents that are, have, um, that you can, you know, they're now declassified where there's a real concern with race mixing at that point, because we need to remember that Britain and America were also involved in the eugenics movement of pre-war, which starts to disappear after the war. But then you have, um, you have ex-SS officers, you've got Nazis who are being invited by the British government straight after the Second World War and being settled throughout Britain when black British servicemen are not welcome at that particular point. So it all ties in with what happened to, to those men at that particular point. But hundreds of those men did stay and they, they married Scottish women, they integrated into Scottish society, their children, the grandchildren are still here and can tell the story of that time. So we need to... 
remember the contributions that were made in so many different areas, whether that's um, whether that's intellectuals, whether that's people in, in the war, in the First World War and Second World War. And there are there are so many stories that we can tell. I think people will be, be quite shocked to know what there is. Any other stories from the panellists that they'd like to bring? Well, what, what is rather interesting that Joseph Knight, um, I've said it before, he had a he had a white wife. Mm. And therefore, in fact, you know, that shows the society as it was. And I, the only thing I'd like to add after Lisa is to just say, you know, we're one humanity, nothing less. And that's what we should teach. Thank you, Jeff. Olivia, do you have any perspective on that? Do you, think, do you feel that black people are adequately represented in Scottish culture today? I feel from my perspective, like growing up in modern times, I just feel there's not, we're not, black people are not equally represented like as I, as I grew up here and I want to see like wide representation in politics and leadership roles and it shows the potential um, individuals that they too can achieve the same um, roles and goals as the people that they look up to and I feel representation is really vital for people to feel connected and empowered and to feel that they can be involved in it too and it's not just you know just a mainstream of whiteness like everyone can be involved in this too and everyone's equally great and I feel with the population size like of the UK is a predominantly white country and it's 3% of black population and in Scotland's a lot less. And with that, I just feel there's different strategies to try to promote um, diversity, which is like tokenism, which needs to be avoided at all costs. Mm -hmm. And for real representation, it just needs to be like, like black led, Asian led, if they want to promote like a, 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 work, a workforce of people that want to promote diversity. And that's what IYS do. We engage with black and Asian young Scot Scottish people to feel um, included and to feel heard and to try and bring about in society that, you know, we are here to and we're, we want to make a difference and try and dismantle racism at the same time. Thank you. Any final thoughts from you, Melanie? I would say, you know, I'm now a historian. In school, I grew up in Barbados. I hated history. Um, and I hated it because I felt that, you know, I couldn't have articulated this at the time, but the sense that, frankly, white supremacist history, which is what all of us are learning in the aftermath of a world so profoundly shaped by colonialism, is boring. It's boring history. And students disengage. Um, very few people really see themselves um, or, see a potential future represented in those stories. But history is incredibly important because without those stories, it's very hard to imagine how we might organize the world differently. So I think, again, the point is we do need richer stories about the past and we need richer stories that extend our understanding of what history is. So this includes, um, and I think, you know, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say we have to teach, you know, great African civilization, we have to teach the full complexity of the human experience. And part of that is about this longer history of the African continent, which is, you know, the longest human history in the world. And also, I think we have to teach people to be proud. Like, I'm proud of having ancestors who survived slavery. I think that's an incredible human story. And I think particularly young Black students should be taught to feel proud of that heritage. Mm -hmm. That I think as we have these conversations, the idea that, you know, I think it's important to rec not to just teach people that the only black history is slavery, but also to think surviving slavery, that is a history to be proud of. It's a right. heritage to embrace. Thank you. That's, that's pretty much all we've got time for. We're three minutes over, um, but I wanted to say a huge thank you um, to our panelists, because I thought there was a, a real sp a sparkling conversation uh, that covered um, so much and so many really important topics in Scottish and world history, informed and very, very stimulating. So hopefully everyone who joined us this evening also found it like that. Um, so a great appreciation um, to the panelists and just over to Becky now for some fi final comments on how you can support Edinburgh World Heritage. Yes, just a reminder for those of you who may not have had a chance to donate this evening, and um, we know how much you've been enjoying it. Thank you so much for all of your comments and emails. They're really wonderful um, to read. You can text the word Edinburgh WH with the amount you want to donate to 70450. If you'd like to donate £10, please text Edinburgh WH10 to 70450. That's Edinburgh WH10 to 70450.
And if you'd like to become a member and support our conservation work in the city on a regular basis, please go to the member section of our website. And just time to quickly mention that our next event will take place in August and the subject is Edinburgh's response to the climate emergency and we'll send you more materials nearer the time but we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible for that event too. So until then, thank you and good night. Good night.